So good morning again, everybody. My name is Lilia McEnany, and I'm an assistant curator at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture in Santa Fe. And as you know, we are here for the final installment of our ongoing lecture series surrounding our current exhibition, Clearly Indigenous Native Visions Reimagined in Glass. And even though we are not physically at the museum today, and I know Raven and Dan um, are not in New Mexico, um, but I would like to briefly acknowledge the place where this conversation is happening on my end um, in Ogopoge within the Tewa world. As a non-Native person living in so-called Santa Fe, I am a guest in the ancestral homelands of the Tewa people. And I wish to acknowledge all the indigenous folks and communities, Pueblo, Diné, Apache, and so many others, past, present, and future, who walk on these lands and steward this place. And I would encourage everybody watching here today to reflect on the lands on which they reside and how they came to be there. So we are so pleased um, to be joined this morning by Dan Friday and Raven Sky River to close out um, this amazing series of events that we've had. Um, and as you all know, recordings of MIAC's programming are made available on our YouTube channel, um, and, and this will be up within the coming weeks. So keep an eye um, on our Facebook page, a monthly newsletter for that link. And yeah, I would, I'm just really excited to um, have both Raven and Dan here today. So. To kick us off, um, why don't we just start with just brief introductions for viewers who don't know you. Um, can you both just tell us a little bit about like who you are, where you're from, and what you do? And I'll ask Dan, uh, Dan to start us off. Hey, hi, Scutil. Uh, my name is Quote Quote, or Dan Friday. I'm a member of Lemon Nation. Uh, I'm a glass artist living in uh, Shoreline, Washington. Working out of Seattle, Shoreline, ever anything that's hot up in the Northwest here. Um, yeah, I'm uh, happy to be here. Cool. Uh, Raven? Hi, I'm Raven Sky River. Um, I'm part of the Clinkett Nation and I am uh, live on Lopez Island in the San Juan Islands. And I was born out here, grew up out here. And uh, yeah, kind of moving in the same circles as Dan working in the Pacific Northwest, making glass art and um, just uh, kind of working in this realm and inspired by the, the creatures and the environment around this space. Uh, fantastic. I do want to get back to your comment about being inspired by um, the ecosystem around you a little bit later on in the conversation. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. Um, so I know you were both introduced kind of to the arts in high school and Dan, you went to an art specific high school, right? And then taught a summer arts program. So can you tell us a little bit about your artistic journey and trajectory and how you came to working in glass? Mm, yeah, so, I mean, we just grew up making artwork. I was growing up, we didn't have a TV. So I went to an art school that's a fancy school to get into. But I think that like that journey starts from just being young and curious and making things with your hands. Uh, I didn't last too long at that school, to be honest. I kind of got the boot, but uh, you know, I've always kind of had a, you know, kind of leaned into the arts. It didn't really seem practical. Uh, you know, I needed to feed myself. And when I was went to trade school and was a mechanic, I had a tow truck when I was about sixteen and kind of uh, worked you know, you got to feed yourself. And so I worked in the automotive industry uh, until I was about 20. And then I walked into a glass blowing shop and I kind of saw that people were making a living. It wasn't necessarily like an art heavy glass blowing shop, but it was, uh, you know, shortly after starting to work there, I, I kind of knew right when I saw it that I needed to kind of get off the path I was on and out of the trouble I was in. <laughs> and, uh, kind of uh, figure out a way to be creative as opposed to just repairing things, you know, just working in that industry. And I just, it just didn't seem practical, you know, to get a job, you know, you're like, oh, now you go get a job as an artist. It's like, welcome to starving, you know? So when I saw that opportunity to work in a factory and then shortly after that, going to the Pilchuck Glass School and meeting other artists that, you know, we're doing it and, uh, it was, that's kind of, I guess, my introduction into glass, which is kind of tying us into this show, but just as an artist, more or less, it's, I think you just, I've always found that pleasure in making things. 
Yeah. So what would you be able to pinpoint a little bit more what it was specifically about glass when you was were exposed to it to the first time that attracted you to it? Well, I mean, it's just hot. It's dynamic. <laughs> and I think that that's what people that go, I guess there's maybe a video in the museum and everybody at this point, or you can go find videos of making glass, but in the moment, it's so, uh, there's just so much going on. And it is a, a great way, like with the, the kids programs we started, I have a tribal thing I've started or in the hilltop of, kids learn so much earlier now, um, but it just has this great way of like keeping you honest and in the moment and uh, glass, it's, you know, there's fire, there's teamwork, uh, communication. I didn't, I wasn't as good of a communicator, I don't think, until I started blowing glass because you really have to, uh, you rely on that communication and that collective uh, goal with the team to kind of make things. And so that's another thing, just the teamwork. And I mean, it's just hot and it's, it's difficult. I mean, if it wasn't fucking hard, you wouldn't do it. It's like, you wouldn't be entertained if it was just really easy and you were just dunking all the time. Every time you tried to make something, you'd be like, wow, it's, that's no fun. You know, it's challenging. And I, I feel like that is another thing that kind of, you know, once you once you watch somebody do it, you're like, oh, I could do that. And then the minute you try, you're like, wait, this is a little harder than you think. <laughs> um, yeah, it, I think it is d definitely very difficult. But I also don't think many people could watch that and think that they could just do it right off the bat. I think that's unique to you guys. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> kind of amazing that that's um, where your head went. I that's really spectacular. Um, Raven, what about you? Uh, yeah, so I guess. Um, a couple parallels with Dan just growing up, not being, not having a TV, um, and just, uh, you know, my dad made carving tools, so he would have carving classes every winter, um, with people coming to teach. And, uh, so that kind of exposed me to sculptural work and just like the concept that you could approach like a chunk of wood and make something out of it, like a mask or a bowl or something. So, um is just kind of not being afraid of that like like making something out of nothing and that you can just work with your hands and do that that I think was a big introduction to sculptural work for me is just that that concept is is um approachable because I think some people don't I don't know it's like well where do you begin or, or whatever but so so that um you know, looking back in hindsight, definitely influenced uh, kind of my trajectory. But I think that, you know, in the moment, I really didn't have any um, insight into that. I just kind of grew up in that environment and grew up um, a lot of time outside and stuff. And, uh, and then in high school, I was not academically inclined. I really did not jive with uh, a lot of the teachers and and was not interested in the material that was being taught so I did I ended up doing an alternative high school program which is basically I would get credit uh to go work with someone else in the community two days a week um and so I did that for my junior and senior year in high school and uh that was, I, I just asked a friend on the island who had a glass shop if I could help them out and that was my introduction into glass. So I worked with uh, Lark Dalton, who's my mentor, and um, his wife, Corey Height. They have an olive glass here on Lopez. And um, when I started doing that was just kind of like the point of no return. So as soon as, like, as soon as it started melting glass, I was like, oh, this is super interesting. And then just stuck with it from there. So um, I think I... I think I built my own little glory hole and had like the most rudimentary glass shop set up um, at my folks place, like when I was 17 and 18. And then I just, um, you know, the Pacific Northwest is, has a lot of studios. And so I just started like running around the sound, trying to help people out wherever I could work for free, do whatever. And, um, when I first started blowing glass, I was just kind of doing um, Venetian style glass. So it's kind of like you see all the twisty, like spiral forms and cane and stuff. Um, and then I um, 
met some other artists that were sculptors and that's kind of where I started realizing I could actually like tell a story or build some narrative with my work so that that's kind of like the short version of how I arrived at this point but um but yeah I, I think um just starting in high school and then and then sticking with it I was able to build some like muscle memory you know and and then after a certain amount of time, you kind of start to find your voice and be able to build a little bit more of a narrative. Um, yeah. yeah. And so when um, Dan was talking about Glass kind of keeping him honest and in the moment, I saw you nod and kind of smile a little bit. Is that how you feel about it too? Oh, definitely. Glass yeah. is a great teacher. Um, like, like Dan said, it definitely keeps you in the moment. You can't set it down and walk away and come back after lunch and you know think about it you have to just do it while you're there and the piece is hot and um and it also is a great teacher patience it breaks um it's it's a crazy material because after working with it for like 20 years you can still just go into the hot shop and see it do something that you've never seen it do before um it's it's really fascinating in that way that the way it reacts to um you manipulating it and heat and everything mm -hmm. um it's a it's a really incredible material um just from a materials standpoint like it's incredible like that you can make fiber optics with it like touch screens for your phone everything to you know to the artwork that we're doing i mean glasses is a really amazing material so yeah absolutely and um you know I did say I was going to leave questions till the end but we have a really good question that came in that ties into what we're talking about right now um from Leland asking what are your earliest memories of teachers in school that recognized and encouraged your talents and that's to both of you um well I think I think one of my biggest influences in school was um this teacher Steve Adams who basically saw that I had potential to do something, but it wasn't maybe necessarily a school. Um, and just that I was just like messing up and like smoking a ton of weed and just like not going to school. Um, he kind of helped. There was a few other kids in that same realm that like he just helped build a curriculum around us so that we could still graduate school and also like plug in in a different way. And that was, that was a huge, I mean, I credit him with like graduating high school basically. And I happened to find something that I was passionate about and have followed ever since then. So, so, but there was a lot of different people that influenced me in positive ways. And I didn't hate all of school. I love science and, and my English teacher was awesome and stuff. And, um, but, but yeah, he was definitely the, the main influence for me as far as um, getting through the academic aspect and just graduating and moving on. That's an amazing um, person to have in your corner who created a whole yeah. group around you guys. Wow. That's yeah, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Uh, Dan, what about you? Uh, well, yeah, that's a long list. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> in, uh, you know, I'd say some of the first encouraging people are like my grandmother or just knowing that my family of artists that I came from. And I guess in school, again, I was I was no stellar student. I, there was a guy named Jerry Satterley who kind of was the head of the alternative program I was in. And when I would get in trouble, he would just say, I would just go to class in like the ceramics room. He actually ended up getting me into that uh, middle high school thing. Uh, the Northwest School here. I mean, like, again, it didn't last long, but I mean, that list of, there's so many people that have held the door open for me. Uh, and even when it would have been kind of prudent to like close it, have given me a shot. And uh, I mean, I'm a long list of second chances and people kind of, you know, kind of given, Paul Marioni is another person uh, who's been really helpful for me. I mean, the glass world itself is just really embracing um, you know, that again, I only kind of got here, you know, from the, the good nature of people, which was not 100% the community I was coming from. So it was a little bit of a culture shock at first. Uh, but there is such a sharing way 
of uh, the glass making, particularly like if you were a painter, you just go into your studio and you put whatever you want on the radio, you take your time and you may not interact with people, but glass is so necessary to the community. That's why I always tell the young bucks, I'm like, don't burn any bridges. You never know who you're going to have to work for, who's going to be your boss next or what's the, you know, it's just, you need a community. And I think that's another thing that people find when they kind of come into that. You know, there's the list of teachers is too long for me to name, you know, and I'm still learning. I'm still learning. And it's not all glass. I learned a lot of life lessons on this path. Yeah. And I think that point about um, collaboration and partnership in glass has come up a lot throughout these conversations that we've been having with different artists. And I just think that's so interesting in comparison to other mediums, like you're saying, Dan, of being very solitary, singularly focused work. Um, and I know you guys both work a lot with Preston um, and with other artists, um, not only on the Northwest coast, but some in the Southwest. And would you guys be able to talk a little bit more about what that collaboration looks like for you? Either well, I'll just go. I mean, honestly, I haven't worked with, for or with Preston all that much, but he's also been a great mentor for me in other things that aren't, uh, you know, I mean, they're like business related. Like I can give him a call and he's kind of like guided me in some decisions that were like, I mean, you're just, there's so many like, I mean, there's a business of this. I mean, there's like doing phone calls and calling people back and, and being a, a six, I don't know. I don't even know if I'm just having a career as an artist or just being a good person in your community is so much of just showing up and when I'm out there looking for people that I'm, you know, what I if I could tell people, it's like part of just showing up is returning a fucking email, man, or like calling people back or just showing up when someone else does it. A lot of times it's not always the best part. It's the person that shows up. And there's so many times that, uh, you know, I tell people, you, you just got to show up and, and press them for a large, uh, you know, he's shown up for me and like answered the phone kind of, kind of helped me figure some of these things out. And, you know, I have worked for him a couple times and, you know, but I, I think uh, he largely introduced me to the the people in uh, Santa Fe at the gallery. One of the galleries, the Blue Rain Gallery that I, I work with, he put together like a group show and uh, years ago and, you know, introduced me. I was going to the Swaya Market, Indie Market. That was kind of my first introduction down there and having a booth and, you know, I'm like, well, what do you do? Do you go with the booths? Do you go with the galleries? And he's like, well, you know, do you want to come drive all your shit from Seattle every time you got to come down here? Um, I don't know, just little things like that. You know, he's got some, uh, you know, he's definitely pretty far down the road and he's got some, and he's also just somebody who's got that even, uh, even he's pretty even, even tempered dude. I mean, as far as like collaborations go, that's kind of what glass is even, if I'm the designer, I'm collaborating with the other artists that I rely on to have X amount of years of skill because any of us can break the piece at any time. I mean, there's a lot of other collaborations like with uh, Lillian Pitt and I mean, you just never know what doors are gonna open. That That's one of the beautiful things with Glass is that so many different artists do collaborate together. What did you work on with Lillian Pitt? Uh, just a series of her, like she's Columbia Plateau style, like Sally Beggs and uh, you know, a couple, it's uh, basically just basket forms and these petroglyph pieces and, uh, you know, but th that's, I find a lot of joy in the collaborating with other people because it allows you to kind of get, you know, even though we do work with other people, you kind of get like, you know, you're on your own path, not the tunnel vision, but you kind of, uh, you know, I don't have to argue about my, not even argue, but I'm just like, you have one set of eyes. And when you have a couple different set of eyes on a possible project or ideas, it, it takes on a life of its own. And I think that's when it's working the best anyway, is when it's not just like one person's thing. And we've kind of like, you know, when, when the idea, when the, when the idea like spitballs and grows outside of either one person's scope and, you know, I think that's when it is cool. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Raven, what about you? What are your, some of your thoughts on collaboration? Uh, yeah. Um, well, I wanted to echo Dan a little bit just on the previous question too, just like as far as glass and, and teamwork goes, I mean, it's, it's such a teamwork oriented thing, but um, that really does translate into community. I mean, it's not just like 
glass community and co-workers is like a community of friends that we go to each other's births and weddings and funerals and and all of those things and um so i think that glass is really amazing in that way and that it fosters community um because of that teamwork aspect but as far as collaboration goes um i think i think it's it's really um an amazing way to work there's so much like if i'm working on my own work it still takes a team of people but I have creative control and I think as artists we all we all have spent our careers trying to hone our our vision of our work and um say what we want to say with our work and uh and you know develop our technique um and so it's really hard to like let go of that creative control but then when you do that in a collaborative setting you come out with something that you would never have made on your own. So it becomes this whole new um, thing that takes a life of its own, like Dan was saying. And, and that's where, you know, when done right, it really comes to life because it, I think it has the opportunity to kind of transcend any one individual artist's work and become something that's, that's maybe a little more or a little different than you would have seen um, if you were just producing work on your own. And, you know, I think, I think uh, some collaborative work has the potential to kind of be like, well, I made this thing and then someone else slapped their imagery on it or whatever. But, but um, I think also um, certain collaborations, you can tell when there's a certain amount of give and take and things are working cohesively. It just really flows and, um, so it's been it's been really cool working with Preston. I've been doing some collaborative work with him, and I think his imagery, um, just like my work, works really well as a canvas for his imagery. And um, just doing native species and stuff, and then having the um, Northwest Coast form line design on it, it just really kind of puts the native and the native species. And I think it's really effective um, way to present the work. So I've really been enjoying that, but. Um, I also collaborate with my wife, Kelly O'Dell, who's also a glass artist and have done collaborations with several other people. And um, yeah, I, I find it to be super gratifying and it's a little bit of a challenge letting go, uh, but it's a good challenge because like I say, it brings it brings something that, to the table working with other people and, and in, in a creative way um, that you wouldn't get otherwise. I'm trying to get Dan up here so we can make something together. Yeah, but, do it. Yeah, yeah, and that work you and Preston have been making is beautiful. Thanks, man. Appreciate you know that. that. Yeah, thank you both for sharing all of that. Um, I think it's interesting that you brought up that concept of like control and artistic vision. That's something that's also come up a lot throughout all of these conversations. And I always think about, um, I mean, in the Southwest, a lot of the um, potters and ceramicists always kind of, express that the clay will do what it wants to do and you kind of have to let go of that control in that way too and I think that's a really interesting parallel between glass art and ceramic art in particular. Um, so I think that leads us really well into uh, moving a little bit more into a conversation about process and technique. Um, Raven I'd like to start with you I know you're kind of known for um, your offhand glass sculpting technique. Can you talk a little bit about what that looks like um, and what that means for you? Well, I mean, it's kind of dangerous water to tread in because total glass nerds. So I'll just starting like <laughs> talking about oh, all God. the process, oh, technique, and <laughs> all sorts of vernacular most people wouldn't understand. Uh, I guess, um, you know, for me, I don't know. I th I think there's a there's a lot of pleasure that comes from making utilitarian work. I really love like making a cup that somebody drinks out of every day, or you know, just there's something so pleasing about being able to use a handcrafted object um, in your daily life. But um, but for me, so much more ability to to um, tell a story. So. 
you know, as far as technique goes, man, I can't say enough for all the people that I've learned from, you know, um, my peers and my predecessors. Mm -hmm. And I think we all stand on the shoulders of our predecessors and kind of another beautiful thing about glass and the glass community and the teamwork, um, at least in, in this area, I know it might not be this in all places in the world, um, but technique is openly shared. You know, if I'm like, hey, how did you do that? Or like, what, how do I get this color thin enough? Or what do I, people are very willing to share information and kind of the, the um, basic like saying is like technique is cheap. So like you can, you can take any technique to do anything you want, but then you just have to do your own thing with it, you know? If I think it's it's obviously frowned upon if you just take that technique and then make a knockoff of someone else's work. But but um, technique is something that we learn so much from from our predecessors. So how do you encase silver foil without burning it out so that it looks like a salmon when you stretch it out and it's all um, scaly and silver? Um, those are all just really basic things and they're not secret, but then, you know, it's, it's then and, and how you form the glass and how you make it that makes it unique. So, so for me, so much of what we do is process. Like I love the process. Um, but like, as far as every object, I think everything I make and probably everything Dan makes and most anyone starts out as just this bullet shaped bubble or a bullet shaped solid glob of hot glass and um and um then the the um kind of poetry and stuff comes in was how you layer the colors and how you then stretch that out and make the form that you want to make so um there's so many di different varieties of colors and forms and combinations that um it's pretty much endless which again is what i think holds our fascination as glass artists there's just so much to explore um but yeah i don't know if that answers your question it's kind of a broad question as far as technique goes um there's definitely a lot to it and and there's a certain set of steps as far as technique goes so whether we're making a big basket for dan or I'm making a humpback whale for me. Dan and I wouldn't necessarily have to talk about that too much because we know it's gonna eventually get a punty and it's gonna be open from the other side and it's gonna be worked. And then it's, you know, there's this set of steps kind of. So that's an interesting thing in glass blowing and glass technique is kind of like you can, and I have like just gone to Japan or Turkey and you can blow glass with someone there, even if you don't speak the same language because the technique follows a similar set of steps, which is really interesting. Um, so we all kind of speak the same language of glass making. And um, that's another really cool thing about glass is the community can kind of bridge these cultural and language barriers um, because that technique is, is kind of, uh, been learned and shared um, throughout the world. Um, a lot of that disseminating from Italy and Venice, but but a huge amount of technique has been developed in the United States in the studio glass movement too. So yeah, I love how you said technique is cheap. I think that's so such a fantastic way to put it, um, and to really kind of think about how all of this information is being shared all of the time. Um, Dan, what about you? Can you tell me a little bit about your um, technique or your process or what that looks like for you? I mean, there's very few things. I mean, I've got a couple that I feel like, wow, I think I might've come up with that, but it's hard, to, that's, that's kind of a stretch too, because so much has been done with glass as far as like technique goes. And again, it, we've inherited so much from, uh, you know, the European, vast European background. Um, you know, just all the, there's just so much innovation, you know, it's like to actually come up with something novel that is just like kind of your thing. It's not impossible, but there is just such a history, you know, like, oh, I've done this. And then you go through the history book and there's like, oh, there's one of these. And obviously it doesn't look the same and we've got uh, new tech techniques, but it's, it's a lot like, uh, like if you're a musician, I mean, you kind of have this toolbox that you work with and like what's possible 
there's definitely a lot of give and take. Uh, I like things to be glassy and some things that I'm really like, you try and impose your will on it to be one way and you're like, well, or maybe it's just gonna be this way and that's how it looks the best uh, or, you know, is just gonna be that way. Um, but as, as far as like the technique, like being a musician, so you've got to suck for a long time before people don't want you to practice in their house or, or whatever. You've got to have, you've got to have these notes or this understanding, this, this dialogue with the material to achieve. I mean, it's, it's so hard to start making things that aren't like, you really start just mastering these things. Often I started in a factory or like attempting things or like, Everybody kind of goes through it. This is my amphora vase phase. Let's give Kane a whirl. Let's uh, try, you know, let's try a thing. Pull a pony. You know, there's all these like things that are handed down to us, but they give us this repertoire, repertoire with our like, hands and our and the relationship with the tools and just kind of trying how to how to do it. You know, it's like rarely do you start off. It takes so long to to kind of like cultivate you know just to find your voice in anything um but you got to bang out some of the classics to get there and uh that's that's where this intersection that's what's so cool about the studio uh glass mo movement is like uh you know what you know they're expounding on these techniques that you say that are you know thousands of years old and uh there's definitely innovation but we use the same set of hand tools that they've been using for thousands of years there's not I mean, there's definitely tweaks and 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 there's new things and uh, and I'm still blown away when I see something new happen, uh, you know, because that ha that does happen. Uh, but I mean, there's just a cataloged thousands of years of glass has been made. Um, you know, I think we're definitely kind of in a, you know. Not that the like, you know, there's definitely an era of glass here, the studio art glass. I mean, I guess if that's the name of it, but it's really a global thing too. Uh, you know, it's so you go to Japan, but they are, you know, I have never been, I really like to go, but just, they do their thing a little different. The, the Australians definitely have a like, wow, man, that is cold work to have. There's like definitely like an approach that they, they take or, uh, you know, it, classic Maronese design you know as, as somebody who's in glass you can kind of see some of the the similarities and you know definitely say there's kind of a, a northwest style up here you know definitely I do think we are in like I, I heard you almost say renaissance and then switch to era but it sounds it does seem like we are in a bit of a renaissance of glass and every so many people across mediums um and around the world seem to be really interested in glasswork right now. And it's just really spectacular to see and learn from all of you um, through that, so. Well, it's just only been available to independent artists like recently, you know what I mean? Like the ability for the, the call, you know, Harvey Littleton, the history is pretty like these guys, these pioneers of just doing it in your garage and not part of a large conglomerate or a factory or something like that. It's it's the, the pioneering aspect of it. And I think even now, so, you know, and that teamwork thing, but now there's like, people have these small hobby setups and then just the advent of like lamp working has just blown up. That's just an achievable thing. You can buy like pretty fat, like in the beginning, these guys are just like uh, winging it, you know, just putting these things together with materials cross from different industries and, now you can just like go online and go to the equipment maker and I make X, Y, Z. And before you had to really manifest it yourself. And uh, I guess it's, it's almost never been easier to be an independent glass artist or, you know, especially working in the torch or it's achievable, that sort of stuff. Raven, would you agree yeah. with that? Well, yeah, I mean, the torch, the torch working um, is pretty, it's pretty approachable. Um, not technique wise. I mean, the, the people in the flame working industry are definitely like pushing the bounds of, oh, of yeah. Pyrex and stuff like that. And, and okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I was just, I was just saying, yeah, like as far as the, the equipment you need for lamp working is like a propane bottle, an oxygen bottle, a nice torch, which will cost you some money and a, and a small kiln. And then, you know, with soft glass, uh, it's a much more expensive addiction and you need all the infrastructure. So you need a furnace and you need 
uh, at least a couple kilns and you need uh, a working uh, like a uh, furnace that you work out of so the glory hole and um, it's like we had to build a whole studio and then build all the stuff to go in the studio and plumb it all and do all of that so it's a massive amount of infrastructure um, which is why a lot of artists rent from other places or uh, you know work in other studios um, because because doing the soft glass setup is definitely a huge investment um, and so I would say to anyone who's thinking about getting into it um, there's a lot of great opportunities and stuff and there's a lot of people that you could assist and all of that but um, it's a very expensive addiction <laughs> so uh, yeah, you kind of got to get in where you fit in, I guess. <laughs> Great. Um, so I'd love to shift the conversation a little bit towards content. Um, Raven, earlier um, you brought up your influence from the sea creatures and the marine e ecosystem um, that you live within. Can you share a little bit about those influences? I see um, your shirt has a very recognizable design. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm like, if you couldn't tell by my work, I'm super inspired by the marine environment. Um, and then just growing up out here and, and as a kid, we and even now we still go on trips to the outside of Vancouver Island and um, try to get out in nature, go to the Olympic Peninsula. And, um, and as a young kid, I was spent some time in Alaska and stuff too. And, and uh, just like those memories, um, recent and distant memories of just being like having a humpback whale like feeding on smelt like right in front of your kayak or like seeing like rocks covered with sea lions all over them and hearing them growling and checking them out is just like super impactful um and catching a salmon for the first time or any of those experiences are like deeply ingrained in who i am and um I think that not everyone, but a lot of people have had these intimate kind of interactions with nature, whether it's your bird feeder in your backyard or whatever it might be. But I think for me, I, I like to try to just um, kind of draw you in as a viewer and have you kind of like bring you back to that spot where maybe you, you had this connection um, with the natural world. And so my work is, is mainly focused on the native species of this area, although I, I've dabbled in a lot of other um, things as far as subject matter, but biodiversity to me is, is just such an incredible thing to see all the different niches that are filled in the ecosystem. And it offers this like unlimited um, kind of reservoir of, of um, inspiration to draw from and I don't know I think I think with my work I'm trying to capture some like essence of life or or this moment of movement and um, the glass definitely lends itself to that kind of fluid uh, movement and so it's a static object but I try to give it this dynamicism so it, it looks like it's captured in a moment and I think the glass is also a good metaphor for like uh, the fragility of these ecosystems and and kind of uh, what we like it could be there for thousands of years if you take really good care of it like this you know we can still dig up Roman glass and it's perfect as the day it was made but you know if you drop it it's it's in a thousand pieces and it'll never be the same so I think it's kind of a good metaphor in that way um, as far as the material goes and and yeah that's that's kind of my basic thrust in my work and my inspiration yeah i really appreciate that comment about the fragility of the ecosystem as it relates to glass i never thought about it that way that's really fantastic and um I think the concept of movement is so apparent in your pieces, especially the um, the whale and the turtle that are in Clearly Indigenous at Mayak right now. Um, those pieces, you can just feel the animal moving. You know, it doesn't feel like a static object or item in the show. Um, so I really appreciate that about your work in particular. So thank you for sharing that. Um, 
And Dan, what about you? I mean, from my perspective, I see, I feel like you're most known for um, creating totem poles in glass, but can you tell, talk a little bit about your content and um, where you draw your inspiration from? Well, I definitely get inspiration from nature as well as a, uh, just like what Raven was saying and, you know, reverence of uh, wild, wildlife, nature, these, these ancestors, these cousins, these, these people that we share the, the earth with, we're so removed in our uh, concrete jungle. It's, I think, just that experience of seeing uh, these, uh, these animals, our, our cousins in, in, in real time in life. If you've ever stood face to face with a bear in the wild, it leave, it'll leave a mark on you. And uh, I know it did for me. And uh, just see, you know, seeing those things or spending time you know, holding an owl I found on the road, I think was really when the first part, I mean, my story kind of goes back a little different. I also, you know, I think a lot of my artwork, I'm kind of sharing my uh, journey introspectively into a lot of my family's history as artists. My uh, my great grandfather was a story pole or for lack of a better term, totem pole carver, um, Joseph Folaire, Cole Cole, we share the name. And uh, it means either story of the work club, but more the version of my name means storyteller. And uh, yeah, I think that, you know, my, that journey, especially with the, the work with like the, the Shwala or the reef net, it's like, I spend so much time learning about this stuff that it, you know, it, it comes out in my work. These are things that I, I can uh, process or am exploring these these things in glass, but I learned so much from them. You know, just like you don't see the teamwork that happens in making the physical pieces of glass that you're looking at. I've, uh, and learning these, learning so much about the history of my family and, and the local Coast Salish culture. Um, that's where I find a lot of the joy, you know, that's, un, that's, part, of, that's part of the path I'm on is, is really researching that or spending time learning the ways of the ancestors and the present community that I'm part of that's outside of maybe the glass community, you know, what I can, how I can participate. Uh, you know, it's, are you really a community member if you're not there? You know what I mean? Like, uh, it's so easy to get lost in uh, just the day to day. Like, dude, I live in the city. I'm on the grind. I spend X amount of hours a day in traffic and then, how special is that, you know, you get so, so removed from that, you know, that joy, like Raven was saying, when you catch a fish and when you get a, that fish, what I'd say is different in native culture is, you know, that, that reverence we've always had for the animals and the, the creatures that we share the planet with. And, uh, you know, I'm not just catching a fish to eat it, but I know that that fish is sharing its, its, its life force with me. You know what I mean? It feeding your family that way. And, uh, it, you know, my, my connection going back and, uh, you know, studying the works of, of people where I'm from, you kind of hit what I've heard uh, a mentor say to me is the ancestral wall. You know, I don't want to go back and just recreate the things out of the book or studying this. I, I'm doing a disservice to them. You know, I'm not moving things along, you know, and just replicating something that's already been made or someone else's work uh it's my job to try and find my 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 version of that and uh you know when you hit that ancestral wall but what do you add to the line you know what are what are your grandkids going to learn from what you did you know that just you could do somebody else's work too or you know that uh so i'm trying to you know obviously i'm making contemporary work in that it's glass you know as far as a native artist goes but i'm just I mean, I like making cups. I like making things that are sculptures that are just glass and not uh, informed that way, but I probably get more traction for this. And that's not the work I spend a lot of time on, but uh, you know, there's definitely, you know, I, I'd say that my glass work kind of reflects my journey and learning about my culture as much as I can. And, uh, you know, just just that sort of, you know, when my last show, I tied a reef net, a shwala, to go with the glass salmon that I made. And if that wasn't the hardest thing I did, it just took hundreds and hundreds of hours and gathering the cedar rope and spending all that time making it. It's like, 
I just have such a new respect. It's all these people must be doing to like live, to get here. They lived so that I could get here, you know? They struggled, they worked really hard for me to get here. And I think that we were pretty used to the convenience of going and just grabbing what we want off the shelf. These people worked really hard to be here. And, uh, you know, there was no such thing as child labor laws, boy, because everybody must have been making those ropes. And uh, it, uh, you know, just that, that's the behind the scenes of, of my work that I find so much joy is being able to connect with the ancestors and uh, my community in a way, and this intersection of modern and traditional things, you know, like corning, these Roman things like Raven's talking about when I'm studying at Corning and I see the bust of Akhenaten and it's 3,500 years old and the last totem pole of my great grandfather is like 80% fiberglass. These ethereal things that we work with historically, these return to the earth, you know, and being able to work in this very fragile but permanent material uh, and try and tell these stories of my family, that brings me a lot of joy because that's, uh, you know, these things, uh, my last show is called Future Artifacts. And, uh, you know, these things that we're making, they're going to be around forever. And uh, jokingly, tongue in cheek, I'm like, man, you cannot use all this research resource and just make landfill glass. You're making something that you stick in your garden and breaks next year and pitch that thing and it's over at Value Village. And not that I'm saying my works are, are you know, one better than any one other, but you better be making something special because there's so much energy that goes into this. And, uh, you know, it's, you're adding your, you're in a rare position as a glass artist these days to be able to make what you want to your vision and not be uh, tied to a, a factory or, you know, just be this independent designer and maker at the same time. It's like, uh, you should find something special to you to make. And that's, I, I definitely see and I see is, is really taken over a lot in the design, you know, people making these really personal effects in glass, telling these stories in glass. And I think that's the end of, at the end of the day, the goal for my work is to tell a, a story, even if I do attach it to a, a pretty shiny object. Thank you for sure. sharing all of that. Yeah. yeah, that was fantastic. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left here. So I'm gonna um, open it up for questions. Um, and the first question that we have that's come in is um, actually from a member of our education staff um, who asks, who says, at Mayak, we get a steady number of tours of all ages. From your perspective, what are some key points that you would want a museum docent to share about your own work for any age group? I think I th if talking about technique and um, muscle memory and all those things, I think I think it's important that, I mean, I think I could speak for myself anyways, that just like following that passion is, really important because if you if you're not driven um i mean i think dan would agree that as a self-employed artist you have to be a self-starter you know there's no one out there saying like oh you gotta you gotta be at work at eight o'clock like like no i mean we are constantly working our asses off um and there is an economic aspect to it because we have families and we have mortgages just like everyone else everyone wants to think Oh, you're you're an artist. You must just you know wake up in the middle of the night and be inspired and go out and like. No, I'm I'm thinking about my financial situation, you know. Um, but whether it's whether it's kids or whether it's other people coming through on the tour, I thank you so much. It's like what makes you want to get out of bed in the morning? Like, like if you're not, you know, you should strive for that. And um, a lot of people have to make other decisions and stuff, but I think if you can, if you can um, follow a passion, it's gonna definitely make, um, make, it's gonna show in the results of your labor um, that, that you cared. And I think that's really important. And, um, you know, and also I think just like making art for the sake of making art is a good thing, everyone, I think every single person is born as an artist, you know, all kids draw, all kids do these things. And we all unlearn being an artist. Like people are like, oh, I'm not an artist. I can't do that. It's like, well, I mean, you don't have to make it for someone else necessarily. 
like we've made our lives and our careers out of it, but it's so cathartic just to like draw something or sculpt something or do something with your hands. And it doesn't have to be for anyone else, you know, like it can just be your own practice. If that feeds you, like do that and don't worry about judgment because you don't have to show it in a gallery. I think, I think being an artist is part of being human and, um, so many people deny that aspect of their lives because they were told they couldn't be that or they told themselves they couldn't be that or they somehow unlearned um, how to connect with that part of their being. And I, I don't know, that would be my kind of gentle nudge. Like if, if you like to draw stick figures, draw a stick figure, you know, it doesn't have to be gallery worthy, um, but it is, it definitely feeds my soul to, create and I think a lot of people feel that um that urge you know so Dan what about you yeah I would say that like you said a lot is unlearned and that we are creative people just naturally kids are curious um you know and being an artist you know like in my path like I mentioned the owl or you know I remember when I told my auntie uh Fran James or she taught me uh, you know, hey, look, I work for Dale Chihuly now, and I've been working for all these people. And she's like, well, where's your artwork? And, uh, you know, that's, you know, as a, as an artist, you know, nobody just hands you the keys and just like, all right, go, go make it. You really, you got to be a self-starter. And uh, aside from being uh, financially secure, independently wealthy, we're also running these businesses. And, uh, you know, like the, the illusion is like, oh, you just take your time. It's like, no, often I work 16 hour days, you know, because I'm stubborn and determined. And so many people see your successes. They don't see the hours of like being an artist is being stubborn and being like, no, I'm going to get it, especially glass. I got to break. I got to break a bounce a lot of these off the floor. And, you know, if it was like I said earlier, if it's too easy, we wouldn't be entertained. But it's the whole market uh, marketplace and you know yeah people vote you into success with their dollars as an artist but that's not the case to be an artist is just creating things that mean something to you and then uh, if you're in playing in the the marketplace of popular opinion or what's marketable and what's not you know that definitely those are different arenas but just being an artist and so the question was so what do you think I want people to take away from seeing my work what would you tell the kids and you know this is a culmination of a lot of, there's stories behind it and you're seeing the success here but you know the 10,000 hours so you know you got to keep your chops up it's a like you know that being a musician and you just have to practice there's so many hours of practice and, and stuff that people don't see and, and it is a, a pathway or a way of life to be an artist and it's uh on the surface it's like yeah maybe you see that those successes, but it's like, there's lots of failure, lots of uh, uncertainty. Um, if it's worth doing though, you'll stay after it. And, uh, you know, I think again, it keeps you honest. You know, there's, there's, uh, there's nobody that's made it. I mean, I think in anything, but in glass, like it weeds the people out that aside from being independently wealthy are not willing to work really hard anything worth doing is worth you know going to school get a degree in whatever it is maybe you don't create things with your hands there's a fair amount of people that are you know I don't I won't get into I, I'm not sure about left right brain thing I know that I'm made to make things with my hands that's just a part of who I am and, and while I'm scratching that itch if I can find a way to feed myself with that too uh, that that works out uh, but like, I think if you're talking to these kids, you know, don't be discouraged. You could be the next one. You know, you could do this too, but it means that you show up because a lot of times just part of it is just showing up We're and then taking a big, taking a big fat L and then showing up again. You know what I mean? Like, and not giving up. And like, that's why I say this, this industry, particularly, you know, if you don't got the money to do it, cause you're just like in the back of your head when you're like, Hey bro, I want to be creative. It's like, man, this is like a fire drill. All better be there in the morning. I don't care how hungry you are. I'm spending 2,500 bucks a day. You better bring at least your egg, you know. You can work hungover and drunk and whatever, but you better, uh, not that they are. I'm just saying, you just, this is like the, you know, it, it has an intensity to it that uh, 
there's there, there's nobody that is a success on this that doesn't isn't just determined you know and uh i mean i think that goes with anything you know and being a business owner i i like having that freedom to do my own thing but i'm here i'm sitting at dale's house right now i'm supposed to be on out on the floor working but i still i, I bring in i gotta bring in those chips you know the meter is always running and so when you're trying to get in your creative zone and in the back of your head you can hear the ding ding you're just racking up the dollar signs <laughs> like no go be creative bro and it's, so it's it's it it is a balance and i don't think anybody you know and that's one thing when you go back to Preston, that guy is a cool cucumber you know and he's how many things did he have to fit, break? You know, he's just got that, you know, I'm kind of a little intense, you know, but in, a, in I think the most, uh, you know, that's what I've learned from Glass is how to be a good communicator and how to step back and how to, to take these things. And so, I mean, sure, I want people to see my glass and be like, I like making pretty things. I'm not opposed to that. And I know that there's a, there's a I mean, every six months, there's a whole graduating class of like, uh, institutional artists and it's like like when i say aunt fran she's like i'm like but auntie i'm not like accredited these guys all went to fancy schools and what's an mfa she's like i'm not accredited i'm in the smithsonian i make things with my hands that's what you do yeah. you got to hurry up and make those mistakes like if you're waiting yeah. on somebody to hand you a card that says you're anointed now go be an artist good luck don't hold your breath for that you know so Am I yeah. sucking all the air out of the Zoom? <laughs> no, I thought no. that was spitting knowledge. It's great. <laughs> and actually, I think that's like a perfect place to end it. <laughs> so <laughs> unless there's anything else that you guys want to uh, chat with my audience is about. Um, but I think we're... I think uh, we both got to get back to the shop. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Well, thank you guys so much for being here. Um, it's been yeah, a complete joy us. to hang out with you guys in the morning. Um, so, and we're so looking forward to seeing what you both do next. Um, and nice thank you everybody for tuning in. It.